Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome back from your discussion groups, if you are in one of our groups. And if you're joining us on the live stream, welcome here. We're so glad that you can join us in this way. If you're in a self-study group or um, just joining the live stream um, just to check it out, we're glad you're here. And I hope it's going really well for you in your study. Tonight, we are on lesson three of the Christian story. We have been looking at what is the story of the Bible that we believe as Christians? So I'm just going to review where we are at. This was a, our plot arc that is showing us where we're going in this story. We started in lesson one with the ordered creation. Then last week we learned in lesson two, sin and its consequences, the conflict of our story. Tonight we're going to be looking at the problem of the heart. And we'll go up in this rising action and get back to eventually this new earth where sin and death are defeated, where we also learned about last week, those bookends of the story. But tonight we are looking at the human heart. The heart is wicked, God says, but I wanted to start first looking at how does our culture view the heart? To us, I think in our world, the heart is good. It's the inner true self that we should listen to, the way to happiness. Our heart is considered pure and good. I found a couple quotes from, um, from pop culture people, from Rihanna. She says, I always believed that when you follow your heart or your gut, when you really follow the things that make you feel, that feel great to you, you can never lose because settling is the worst feeling in the world. Steve Jobs said, don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. These quotes sound inspiring, empowering. They sound really great and maybe have a little bit of truth in them in some moments and instances. But when you read those quotes and then you come to our discussion today, our texts that we have been reading, well, following our heart doesn't sound very smart at all. The chapters we've just read and discussed suggest that this message to follow our heart is actually a dumb idea. Last week, we saw the tragic consequences that happened to Adam and Eve when they chose to follow their desires. Their relationships, their role, and their futures were all affected negatively. And this week, we have seen how sin has ultimately ended up corrupting the whole earth. And where does this sin comes from? God says it's the human heart. And that's what we're gonna flesh out a bit more in the next few minutes. So we looked at Genesis 6 a lot today in our study. I'm gonna read it for us again. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. So these verses make it very clear that there is a problem, and God is going to intervene. We're going to look at this text and, and the verses that follow in three ways as God diagnoses the human heart. We're gonna look at symptoms, treatment, and the final diagnosis. So, the symptoms of sin. In that verse, we saw that the symptoms are great wickedness, every inclination of the human heart is evil all the time. So like a doctor would come and, and ask what your problem is and where are you feeling hurt and when does it show up and how long and how much, we're seeing its great wickedness everywhere, all the time. Just let that sink in. In Genesis, we saw the phrase, Genesis 1, we saw the phrase, God saw, repeated again and again and again. But it was followed with, God saw that it was good the creation he had made. Now we see God saw that everything was wicked and corrupt. We call this idea of, of man's heart, this fact of man's heart being corrupt and every inclination being wicked, total depravity. Now this doesn't mean that 
every person is as evil or as wicked as they can be. They only do wicked all the, they, they are inclined to wicked all the time, but it doesn't mean that they are as evil as they could be. What it means that as people, every part of who we are, our thoughts, our emotions, our actions, our wills, is tainted and corrupted and skewed by sin. We, on our own capacity, do not have the ability to do good, to be righteous and holy. This sickness affects each of us, and it affects all humanity we see in this text. And it doesn't just affect our hearts, it affects our actions. And these actions affected the whole earth. We saw that the whole earth was corrupted in verse 11. Just like the curse had an effect on the ground from Adam and Eve, sin has continued to affect the whole creation. Genesis 6:11 says the whole earth was corrupt. The word means ruined, decayed, destroyed. And the world was full of violence. This word for violence can, can mean injustice, unjust gain, wrong, cruelty. So we see that this world is full of, of injustice, of decay, of ruin. And God was affected as well. God responds to sin. One of the symptoms is he's regret and sorrow. He says regretted. This word um, we translate as regretted is a Hebrew word that's actually very complex and hard to translate in English. It carries the idea of grief and lamentation. It's to be grown or to be sorry. It's not as if God didn't know this was going to happen. He's God. He's not looking back and wishing he'd done things differently. That's maybe how we would view the word regret, or how we would use it. But in Hebrew, it's God's sense of grief over the injustice of what has happened to his world. It's imbalanced, it's not how it was supposed to be. He's also deeply troubled in his heart. His personal attention and care for humanity and his creation, this causes this grief in him because he loves people and his creation. And so when he sees the horrific effects of sin, he is grieved and distressed. And that is what provokes him to take action. So the sin of two people has spread and caused havoc over all creation. It started so small and yet now has exploded. I think we can kind of relate a little bit just over a year ago, a tiny little disease started in one tiny area of our planet. And over this year, the COVID-19 pandemic has infiltrated every part of this globe. Wherever people are, COVID is. And it hasn't just affected people's health, it's affected economics, it's affected politics, social unrest, mental health, you name it, it has affected everything. But sin is worse than COVID. COVID's affecting a small percentage of people's health. Sin affects 100% of the population, and its effects are far more devastating. As mankind multiplied and filled the earth, they filled the earth with their sin as well. The symptoms are clear, and they are deadly. It's a serious, severe, and weighty problem, and one that demands treatment. And so we see that God will step in and judge. Now, when we think of a God of judgment, a lot of people, I think, see the Old Testament God and his judgment as this God of wrath who's coming with fire and brimstone, and he almost takes pleasure in just destroying people. Or we think of him as coming in vengeance to fix the wrong. Um, I couldn't help but think of Thor from Marvel's superhero Avengers. Um, so bear with me if you're not a superhero fan. But we have Thor, the god of thunder. And we're looking at God here who comes with a flood of judgment. And so it reminded me of that, but pop culture's view of a god of thunder is one who comes in vengeance, he comes to get the bad guys, he acts in judgment, he tries to care for his people, but he doesn't always get it right. He doesn't always deal with the problem properly. And he has his own emotional explosions all of the time. But when we look at the scripture text, this isn't the picture we get of the God of the Bible. When we look at this biblical account, we see God acting, but with a plan. A plan, yes, to destroy wickedness and the corruption, but also a plan to rescue. The flood was as much an act of grace as it was judgment. 
in your homework on page 32, you worked through um, some questions regarding this plan. We looked at what God's role was and what Noah's role was. So I'm just going to review those as well. So in this plan to bring the flood, we see that God initiated the plan. He chose Noah, and he chose his family. He gave him instructions, and he told him the timing. He provided a way of escape through the ark. God himself closed the door of the ark and protected Noah. And God remembered Noah after all of those days in the boat. God remembered, and he sent a wind to bring the floodwaters down. And then in the end, we see God calling Noah out. So God is working and moving in this plan. He is the one providing salvation from the judgment. And what about Noah's role? We see that Noah was faithfully obedient. Repeated again and again, Noah obeyed and did everything that God commanded him. In verse 9 of chapter 6, we saw that Noah found favor with God because he was righteous. But now we see him live it out in obedience. He builds the ark and he gets inside. Imagine if Noah had ignored God's call. Imagine if he argued with God or didn't believe the judgment was actually coming, and so he just went about his day. Or imagine if he decided, okay, the judgment's coming, but I don't like that plan. I'm gonna just climb to the highest mountain and escape this flood. Or what if he decided to build a boat of his own design? A smaller one, one that he could control, maybe. None of these options would have saved Noah. He needed to obey exactly what God had told him in order to be saved and rescued from this flood. That was his only option. Noah was obedient, and then in his obedience, God was also faithful to protect him. This is a beautiful picture of our, God's plan for our salvation. He instigates. He makes a way. He provides the way to be saved from the judgment of sin that we all have in us. His way is through Jesus Christ, his son, and we have to trust, obey, and persevere in that walk of faith to be saved. But that's getting ahead of the story. That's coming up as we keep going. But so often, humanity falls into the act of, of not doing what Noah did. Instead, either we don't believe that judgment is coming, and so we don't look for rescue, or we fear judgment and death, but we try to make our own way to salvation through other religions or trying to do enough good to outweigh our bad. Or we just try to make the best of life because, well, you only live once, so let's make the most of it. Or maybe we think that God is just going to get everyone in the boat in the end. We'll all be saved. Or maybe we think that obeying God shouldn't take work. Noah had to build this ark, but we think maybe God should just do the work for us, and you know what? He should make it a cruise liner so it's fun. But that is not our call to faith. It's obedience, it's hard work, it's perseverance, and it's trusting God's plan. We need God to make a way, and we need to obey it. So God's ultimate treatment, whoa, was the plan to judge and to rescue so we saw in those verses that God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy them and the earth, so make yourself an ark. I'm going to bring the floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, but I will establish my covenant with you. So God treated the symptoms of sin, these people and their wickedness, by destroying he justly judged their sin, and he rescued Noah. Success, right? God got rid of all the evil people, the corruption, the violence. Life should be free sailing now, right? Pun intended. So, is that the case? Well, we have one more repeat of God's diagnosis. In fact, the final diagnosis, which you read in Genesis 8:21 was that every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. That same line repeated again in Genesis 8.21. So what happened? Though sin was judged, was it taken care of? Was it dealt with? It wasn't solved. Ultimately, 
it wasn't solved because the human heart is the problem. The heart is sick. The heart is sinful. We often try to solve the problems of our world by just getting rid of the bad guys. That's literally what every superhero movie is about. Beat the bad guys and then we'll have peace. In the 1800s, Britain tried to do this by sending all the convicts to Australia. We still try to do this by locking up criminals in jail or having a strong enough law code. If people would just obey and the bad ones were just, just not here, we would live successful, fruitful lives, right? We keep trying to solve the problem by treating the symptoms. And yet this story shows us that it's our own hearts that are the problem. We are part of the bad guys. Even though Noah was considered blameless in his generation, he still carried inside him and inside the hearts of his wives and his children this sinful heart inclined to choose their own desires over God's. But how do we know that God's diagnosis was correct? We have proof. In Genesis 9, 20 through 25, if you flip in your books to page 35, we have the text there for you. I'm just going to summarize this story that God gives us in Genesis 9. So Noah and his family have come out of the ark with enough time, and Noah has planted a vineyard in this new earth that they have. He's planted a vineyard, he ends up getting drunk, and then he lies exposed, passed out naked in his tent. One of his three sons named Ham comes in and sees him. And then he goes and tells his brothers and invites them to come and see their father's shame. The other brothers, Shem and Japheth, do not follow through. They come and actually cover their father and respect him. In the end, Ham is cursed by his father, and Shem and Japheth are blessed. So this little story, what is it doing here? It seems kind of random, and yet in this story, we see the effect of the sin is still there. God has given this family a brand new start. He's shown them his faithfulness, his power against wickedness, and yet we see so quickly this temptation to sin is still with them, and Ham acts on it. The little story is actually really similar to Adam and Eve's fall as well. There's sin and temptation through what they see with their eyes. He invites people to sin along with him, and then there is a curse after the sin. So we see the proof that sin is here to stay. Even in this new start for Noah and his family, it doesn't look like it's going to turn out much better than life did for Adam and Eve. And we see this other places in Scripture as well. In Jeremiah 17, 9, he says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Even in Mark 7, in the New Testament, it says, For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. This doesn't come from out there somewhere. It comes from inside our hearts. That is what the text tells us. And so where does this leave us? With the reality that something else is required. We have to treat this heart problem. So let's take a look at God's long-term response. We're going to see that in the long term, God is determined to engage with and save people no matter what. In Genesis 9, we get a little more detail into what life will be like after the flood. So on page 34, you'll see Genesis 9 written there for you. We see in Genesis 8, at the end there, as the flood finished, kind of a recreation story. Dry land appears, vegetation starts to grow, humans and animals return to the land. And then we're going to see that God's response is to give them three things, blessing, boundaries, and a bond. And that's what we're going to work through over the next couple minutes. So we have the first piece of God's long-term response is blessing. Genesis 9, 1 to 3 says, Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Just like we saw in Genesis 1 and 2, where God blessed Adam and Eve. 
He says in verse 2, The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds of the sky and on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, now I give you everything. So again, we see this emphasis of giving. God is giving to man. He is providing for them. We see lots of similarities to the blessings that they had in the garden. There is this new piece here, though, where there's this fear and dread of the beasts that comes in. So this new frustration piece of their, their rule and um, to subdue the earth is going to be harder because the animals now fear and dread them. They're also giving the animals to eat as a new piece of provision that God is giving them. But we're going to keep going, because the next thing God gives them is some more boundaries. Oh my. There we go. So in verse 4, we see, But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from every human being, too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. So in these verses, we see boundaries set similar to what God gave some rules for Adam and Eve in the garden. He's freely given the animals, but he states, you shall not eat them with the lifeblood still in them. He demands an accounting for death. He shows that life is valuable. God still loves and cares for his creation. And in these texts, we see this accounting for life. God is setting up the first system of justice. He's actually giving humankind the responsibility to curb the evil in the world. He's saying, don't let violence corrupt and go everywhere. Actually, stop it. There are rules. Whoever sheds human blood, by human shall blood be shed. Punishment for wickedness. He says you need to uphold the image of God. And isn't that precious, seeing this? In the image of God has God made mankind. After we've seen the wickedness and sin that's come in, that the hearts of man are evil, God says we still bear his image. It's been twisted and corrupted by sin, but it is there, and every person bears that image, and that is why Every person is valuable because God has instilled them with value. So we see that God has blessed them. He has given them boundaries. And lastly, we see that God gives them a bond. In verse 8 through 11, he says, God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So in this, we see God is initiating a covenant relationship, a bond between him and his creation. A covenant is like a promise, a sacred agreement, In our culture, probably the most easy thing to um, relate that to is a marriage covenant where we promise to be with this person forever, for, for better or for worse. And so God is making this covenant with his creation. Back in Genesis 6, 18, we saw that God made a covenant to rescue Noah, and here he promises to never destroy the world again with the waters of a flood. It is an everlasting covenant, he says in verse 16. And later on in this In these verses, you can see he also gives them a sign. He makes the rainbow a symbol of this permanent covenant. He will continue to be merciful, to be faithful, and to save mankind. What is God's long-term response? It's his blessing, boundaries, and bond. He is going to stick with man. He is going to enter relationship with them. He is going to see this through. We've seen clues kind of along the way that God didn't just just wipe out Adam and Eve. He didn't wipe out humans completely, but rather he chose people and he saved them and he made covenants with them. 
And we're gonna see as the next few weeks continue that God's gonna continue making covenants as a plan to save people and to deal ultimately with this problem of the heart. Because the heart is the issue. And that's what we're gonna continue to learn. And God cares about us and our hearts and that is why David can say in Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That needs to be our heart cry as we seek to follow God and obey him. So this story of the flood is one of the most dramatic depictions of judgment in the whole Bible. And it will be referred to again and again. It is a scary and strong and severe judgment. And yet it's also a beautiful picture of grace and redemption and hope that God holds out. God continues to be patient and continues to pursue mankind. Though we are faithless, he remains faithful. And so we are sitting here at the end of this story, seeing that Ham has continued to sin and there's this curse and this their hearts are, are still wicked. We should feel the weight of this problem and the dilemma that is here. The reality that sin is violent and pervasive, that our hearts are the problem and something drastic is needed. And we look ahead and hope and wait to see what the story is going to bring, the rescue that's going to come through a relationship with God. And we're going to keep doing that as we go through the rest of this course. And so, if you are um, here with us and you're headed back to your small groups, I encourage you to pray for each other's hearts in this. Maybe open up this psalm and pray it for each other. Or as your week goes on, pray these prayers like David did, that God would, would show us the truth of our hearts. I'm going to pray for us now, and then we'll go back to our groups. God, I thank you for this text. I thank you that you are just and good. God, it's hard to to look around and know that, yeah, it's true that wickedness is everywhere, but God, you have provided a way of escape, and I pray that, um, that we would know that way, that we would submit, that we would obey, that we would trust you. God, I pray for everyone listening here that we would have hearts open and soft to know you for who you truly are, your goodness, your grace, and your justice. God, help us to love you and know you more each day. In your son's name, amen. You can head off to your groups.